are worth the trouble. Think of them as a female's insurance policy against losing her children to rapidly evolving threats like measles and the flu. If the reason for sex is a bit less mysterious these days, its origins remain much more speculative. Some believe it all got started billions of years ago with two single-celled creatures sharing a chance encounter in the primordial night. They meet and genes are exchanged. That's what sex is all about. The moment is brief, but it leaves them a little bit stronger, a little more likely to survive and reproduce. Males and females came later, when random change produced a creature that was small and fast, which turned out to be an evolutionary advantage. Organisms with reproductive cells like that are called males. Their goal is to find organisms with a different specialty, providing the nutrients life requires. They're called females. These early pioneers evolved in time into sperm and eggs. Males produce sperm by the millions. With so many potential offspring, it doesn't pay to be fussy about eggs. A better strategy is to try to fertilize every egg you can. Eggs are more complex than sperm and take a larger investment of energy. Females make only a limited number of them. Fewer eggs mean fewer chances to pass on genes. And that means females, unlike males, do better if they're choosy. At a deep biological level, males and females want different things, regardless of how things appear on the surface. Small sperm versus large eggs. Quantity versus quality. These are the evolutionary roots of the war between the sexes. This war is a lot more than fodder for poets, philosophers, and soap opera writers. It can explain a lot about how species evolve and why they look and act the way they do. Charles Darwin was the first to recognize the evolutionary significance of sex. He came to it because his theory of natural selection had a major problem. It beautifully explained why all polar bears have heavy coats. Over time, any trait that improves an individual's chances of survival should spread through the entire population. But it offered no help in explaining the wild extravagances found throughout nature, like the peacock's tail. Darwin had a real problem with peacocks. In fact, he once said, the sight of a peacock makes me sick, because he really didn't understand how it could evolve. An extreme reaction, perhaps. But it is hard to see a peacock's tail as something other than an impediment to his survival. They're heavy. <laughs> um, they're difficult to carry around. They take a lot of energy to grow. Uh, they're conspicuous. And basically, they're going to slow an animal down if it's running away from a predator. And it wasn't just the peacock's tail that Darwin's theory of natural selection couldn't explain. There were also the elaborately ornamented carapaces of beetles and the Baroque extravagance of butterflies. And even the delicate songs of birds. Theologians of his day argued that God created ornate flowers and feathers to inspire man's wonder and devotion. Darwin was convinced there had to be an evolutionary explanation just as there had to be an evolutionary explanation for why so many of nature's ornaments are seen only on males. If natural selection is operating on all organisms the same, why is it in nature that you can see differences 
between males and females. And these differences are actually quite large. Things like antlers or large body size in males that are clearly connected to maleness or femaleness, as if there were two paths. And this really doesn't make sense if you accept evolution by natural selection. It should be operating the same on everybody. It took him several decades to think of it, but eventually he happened upon the idea of sexual selection, which is really Darwin's most ingenious idea, I think. These ornaments are not for our good. They're to advertise each individual's fitness, its goodness as a mate to the opposite sex of its own species. In a sexually reproducing species, survival is no good if you don't find a mate. If you don't convince somebody that you're good enough to copulate with, to have offspring with, your genes will die with you. You won't leave any descendants. Darwin saw two strategies at work in the courtship idiosyncrasies of different species. For males, it's competition. For females, it's choice. Males fight for access to or control over the females themselves, or a resource females need, like food or territory. Sometimes this competition gets downright nasty. But it's just as likely the males of a species will follow the path epitomized by John Travolta in Saturday Night Fever, the path of the peacock, seduction through sexual display. This is where female choice comes in. Female choice is that part of sexual selection that has to do with females choosing particular males over others. You would expect that the female who invests more per egg, per offspring, should be much more choosy about who she has offspring with, who she combines her genes with. Whereas the male who's investing so little, you would expect that he wouldn't care so much. Darwin's contemporaries had no trouble with male competition. But females actively directing evolution through their choice of mates, that was too much. This was the aspect of sexual selection that Victorians really had trouble with. They couldn't imagine that mere female animal brains could be shaping something as, as grand and important as, as evolution itself. In those days, um, females didn't have choices. Um, males decided who they were to marry, for example, you know, and f uh, females really didn't actually have that much say in the matter. So radical was the idea of female choice that it was more than a century before anyone tested it. Marion Petrie's experiments with peacocks were among the first. According to sexual selection theory, peacocks grow their tails because peahens pay attention to them. And peahens pay attention because only a healthy, fit, strong peacock can afford to grow one. To test that, Petrie measured the tail lengths of a captive population of peacocks. Then she charted exactly which males the females chose over an entire mating season. Her data left little doubt. To peahens, size matters. Next, Petrie tried reducing the number of eye spots in some otherwise well-endowed tails. The result was a lonely mating season for the trimmed birds. Finally, Petrie started playing matchmaker. We paired females with males with big trains, and we paired females with males with small trains. And then we looked at how being paired to a male with a big train, what effect that had on the performance of, of um, the female's offspring. And what we found was, is that if you were mated to a male with a, an elaborate train, your offspring survived a lot better. Um, paternity does matter. Peacocks are a classic case of evolution operating through sexual selection. Males compete for the opportunity to mate, and females hold out for the best genes. When females choose a trait that is an honest indicator of good genes, that trait spreads throughout the population over generations. It can also become highly exaggerated. 
It's all a logical consequence of the differing reproductive strategies of males who have lots of sperm and females who have fewer eggs. But the goal isn't just to have offspring. The young have to survive long enough to have their own offspring. Sometimes that requires paying as much attention to behavioral traits as to physical ones. Lizzie, it's lonely as dying out there. Will you come with me? In the Hollywood classic, The Rainmaker, Catherine Hepburn struggled to choose between the sexy, quick-witted Burt Lancaster and the dependable Wendell Corey mirrors a deep biological dilemma. For some species, the chances of offspring surviving increase if a female chooses a mate who'll stick around over the one with the best genes. Evolution has favored in many of the species Stephen Emlin studies, males and females who share the job of parenting. In songbirds, if a male were to be a deadbeat dad and leave and not raise the kids, the kids would die. And basically, no genes would be passed to the next generation because the female alone can't do it. She needs help. But he's only going to give up philandering if he believes the chicks he's staying home to help raise are his own. The result is monogamy, a social solution to a biological dilemma. Human infants are also born heavily dependent on parental care. You can't get it quick enough, huh? Not coming out fast enough for you? Let's try this. Let's try this. Being a parent is, is about bringing up the child, loving the child, sacrificing for the child. And, and Naya, I would, I would give my life for her I, without, without blinking an eye. Everything we do revolves around her. Our needs are second. Um, what she needs comes first. A shared investment in the next generation can reinforce a couple's commitment to each other. What she gave us was completeness. That um, it wasn't just him and I anymore, it's the three of us, and you know, we like the way that sounds, you know. But monogamy isn't easy to maintain. While some evolutionary forces encourage it, others threaten the family values that are at its core. Songbirds are unusually monogamous. But even as they pair off and set up nests, inevitably some of them are lusting after their neighbors. Say here in an Ithaca woodlot, you migrate back from South America, and of the 100 birds in this woodlot of your species, you're the 65th female to return from migration. You find that most of the males have already been taken. You choose the best male available, but you end up paired with a fairly low quality male in comparison with your neighbors. You're in a situation where you now have a social mate who's going to help provide the food and the care for your young, but the neighbors are, in fact, higher genetic quality, perhaps more experienced, more healthy. And if your young could be sired by them, you, in fact, would have healthier young that carry, therefore, the genes to promote and have healthier grandchildren. But for a female songbird, cheating is a risky strategy. If she's caught, her partner will leave. Alone, after the chicks are born, she won't be able to meet their needs. Yet a surprising number of songbirds take that risk. DNA testing has revealed that as many as 40% of all chicks are not sired by the male that helps feed them. Cheating, at least for certain female songbirds, gives their chicks better genes, and therefore a better chance of surviving until they can reproduce. For the wattle jacanas of Panama, survival of chicks is so uncertain it's led to an amazing gender role reversal. Jacanas lose a lot of chicks to crocodiles. They might have died out long ago if they hadn't found a way to produce more offspring. Their solution, the female lays the eggs, but it's the male who keeps them warm 
and raises the chicks. 